We are continuing to follow that late breaking news we first told you about at five. A Bear County deputies responding to a call about a homicide in the 25,000 block of Whistling Acres in far north Bear County. Eventually, those deputies discovering a man barricaded inside with a body. Were they related? Our Jaffney Gray is at the scene now with what we know so far. Jaffney. Yes, guys, when we first got here, of course, deputies had us pushed off back so far that we couldn't even see the home. But here's a clear shot of what the home of the victim looked like. But what's interesting is that neighbors tell us that they realized something was wrong with the victim by the appearance of the lawn. They said that the victim typically keeps his lawn well maintained. Now, Sheriff Javier Salazar says that they got a call for that homicide after one of those neighbors went to check in on them, said they found the victim dead inside of the home. Deputies made a tactical entry into the home, discovered that a man in his 40s was dead from multiple stab wounds to his upper body. While inside, they also learned that the suspect, a man in his 20s, was still in the home and still armed with the murder weapon. At that point, deputies exited the home and called for their mental health unit and negotiators who were able to de-escalate the situation. The negotiator did a great job of convincing. They were able to talk to him through an upstairs window, and they were able to convince him to throw the weapon down uh, before coming out and giving himself up. Sheriff Salazar says that the victim appeared to have been dead for some time, ranging between at least several hours and a couple of days. They also learned that the suspect was suffering from a mental health illness. Now, at this time, they're handling this investigation as a murder investigation. And as far as charges go, Salazar says that they're looking at a murder charge. That is to be expected. But they're also going to evaluate the suspect in this case to figure out what his mental state is and also a motive. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. A date has been set for the resumption of jury selection in the trial of accused cop killer Otis McCain. The trial was put on hold in March due to the pandemic. Paul Venema with that new date and some conditions that are included in the judge's order. Just hours after veteran SAPD detective Ben Marconi was shot to death execution style as he sat here in his patrol car, police arrested 31-year-old Otis McCain. He was charged with capital murder and the DA announced they would seek the death penalty. After several delays as jury selection in his trial finally began in March, the pandemic brought everything to a halt until today. Judge Ron Ronhell announced jury selection will resume on October 26th. This just seemed to be the right time. The courthouse is slowed with in-person hearings. Um, we can go slow. We can take our time. And that's the plan. Jury selection in a death penalty case normally takes about five weeks since each juror is interviewed individually. Picking this jury will take about three times longer than usual. The reason COVID-19 safety protocol. We're going to make sure that between every juror, everybody that comes in, everything is cleaned in the courtroom, make sure that we follow all the protocols as it relates to safety. Each prospective juror will be allowed to share any COVID-related concerns. As for testimony, Ron Hell said it will be after the first of next year before the first witness takes the stand. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Tomorrow night, Republican incumbent Donald Trump and Democrat Joe Biden will be on the same stage in Cleveland for the first of three nationally televised presidential debates. Jesse DeGriado spoke to a political expert who says this debate could be one to remember. When President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden go head to head, it said viewers should expect the unexpected. I honestly, I believe it's a wild card. So I just don't know what the chemistry will be between those two because they're like polar opposites. Trump's strength is chaos. He sort of has a managed chaos. And so anything that Biden says, he's going to try to throw it off course. And then I think Biden's uh, strength is his experience. Um, he has very substantive answers and ideas for policies. What's your best advice for viewers watching these debates? I take notes. That's something that I would recommend. And I, I, I wouldn't believe everything I hear. Viewers, she says, should fact check what they're claiming using more than one independent respected source. Um, so I, I think that's the thing to really watch is how, how much correcting is going on as they're speaking. Both candidates could stick to the issues from the pandemic to race relations to the timing of the new Supreme Court nominee and revelations from Donald Trump's tax returns. But then again, do you think at some point it will get personal? Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I, I think that that's a given. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. The battle surrounding straight ticket voting in Texas continues today. Straight ticket voting allows people to choose one party's entire slate of candidates on a ballot instead of choosing each candidate individually. State Republicans voted to eliminate the option, but on Friday, a district judge blocked that legislation. Bear County Democratic Chair Monica Alcantara says that straight ticket voting is faster, which helps during a pandemic. That is the easy, easier way to do it. it does make it a bit safer, uh, but if things don't go the way we want them to, we still want to ensure that everybody is going out and voting regardless. In a statement today, Bear County Republican Party Chair John Austin said, quote, I am surprised and saddened by Judge Marmolejo's ruling. Hopefully the Fifth Circuit Court will overturn this ruling, end quote. Attorney General Ken Paxton says his office is filing an immediate appeal. Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan says that she will abide by whatever the courts decide. As the city prepares for a historic November election, San Antonio voters will be asked about a trio of sales tax initiatives. Much of the attention on the new plans that city and VIA officials have for workforce development and transportation. The city voters will also be asked about a familiar program. Garrett Berger tells us about pre-K for SA's return to the ballot box. Up to 2,000 four-year-olds pass through pre-K for SA's four learning centers each year with the aim of giving them a strong start at what its board's chairwoman says is the very beginning of the educational pipeline. Kindergarten readiness happens, math readiness happens, uh, increase in, in attendance happens. All these good things begin at the very beginning. And Elaine Mendoza is also one of the tri-chairs for the Keep Pre-K for SA campaign, which wants voters to renew the one eight cent sales tax that provides the majority of Pre-K for SA's funding. In 2012, voters approved the tax for eight years. Now to be asked to give it another eight. If the voters decide not to approve it, we uh, basically come to the end of, at the end of the school year. Pre-K for SA also has programs for grants, professional learning and family engagement. And while a bill passed by the state legislature in 2019 sent more money towards early education and required school districts to host full day pre-K for eligible four year olds, pre-K for SA officials say it doesn't meet the full need for pre-K education. And now, uh, given the pan pandemic and the, the impact, negative impact on the state budget, uh, it'll be a challenge. The sales tax vote was originally supposed to happen in May, but it was bumped to November because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And while this election will certainly have a big turnout, the question will now be near the bottom of a very big ballot. We are not taking anything for granted. We are, we are um, you know, moving forward, you know, as if I, our life depended on it, which it does. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. To see more of our election coverage, along with important information like voter registration deadlines, candidate debates, early voting dates, head to our website at ksat.com. You can click on the Vote 2020 tab. Ahmed is recovering in the hospital after being shot by police this morning. Officers responded to a domestic violence call at the home on Tropical Drive near Palm Bay on the northeast side. When officers got there, they were met by a man who police say had a gun in his hands. Police Chief William McManus says one of the officers pulled out a weapon, eventually firing and hitting the man two times. Chief McManus says it's unclear what caused the escalation, and at last check, he had not yet reviewed the officer's body cam footage. A woman in the hospital after being stabbed in the back by her own son. The incident happened this morning before three on Moss Spring Drive, not far from Palo Alto Road on the south side. Police say earlier the mother and son had been arguing over the car keys. When she decided to go to bed, that's when police say the son allegedly stabbed her. The son detained is now charged with aggravated assault. New details about the arrest of an SAPD sergeant. Glenn McCallick remains on administrative leave this evening after he was arrested yesterday morning on a DWI charge. The arrest affidavit states a patrol officer saw his vehicle swerving while traveling northbound on Blanco Road. When that officer pulled him over, the affidavit says the officer smelled alcohol and the sergeant looked slightly flushed. He also refused a breath and blood sample. He's been with SAPD for 29 years. A refreshing and windy Monday. Absolutely. My goodness. Sarah, Sarah Spivey in for Adam Caskey. Yeah, I hope that everybody was able to bring in any outdoor fall decorations or 
bring in those garbage <laughs> cans or else you'd been fishing for them today. It was definitely gusty. We saw wind gusts of 41 miles per hour at the airport. Want to show you a look outside right now. You can see that it's windy. That camera is shaking. The high temperature of 80 degrees today actually occurred at 4 a.m. this morning before that front moved through. Uh, and ever since then, temperatures have been a little bit more pleasant. We're currently in the 70s and it's been a lot drier outside, noticeably less humid. In fact, one of my uh, colleagues said that the humidity yesterday was just unbearable and today was a nice and welcome change and I agree with him. Now winds are from the north currently at about 15 to 20 miles per hour. That's what's bringing in that dry air and cooler air too. It's in the 70s. Now while that's not cold uh, outside, but it is a lot cooler than yesterday. Yesterday we were in the 90s. So this is a welcome change again. Dry air moving in dew points only in the 40s. And although we have clouds out there right now, we are going to see skies clear. It won't be as windy. We'll still have winds from the north at about 15 miles per hour at times. That's a perfect recipe for cooling. We'll be down in the low 60s by midnight and I'll be back to tell you how cool it'll be in your neighborhood tomorrow morning. We are seconds away from the first daily briefing of a new week on COVID-19 cases here in Bear County. Hopefully we'll be headed to City Hall here momentarily to see some continued trends as those numbers hopefully head in the right direction. Dr. Aga, the queen of data and also the chief of informatics uh, for Metro Health. This is our San Antonio community COVID-19 update. We're reporting 63 new cases of COVID-19 uh, tonight, which brings our total to 57,208 since the pandemic began. Our seven-day moving average has dipped nicely to 139 uh, because we've had, again, those two days, we've had below 100 tests, or excuse me, below 100 cases come in the last two days. Fortunately, we also have uh, no new deaths to report tonight. Uh, we do, uh, again, want to keep those who have lost loved ones, colleagues, Colleagues, neighbors uh, in our prayers tonight. We've lost far too many people during this pandemic, and so please keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Tonight in our hospitals, there are 220 COVID patients. Our total positivity rate is 6% in the hospitals. There are 22 new COVID-19 related admissions to the hospitals since uh, yesterday, and we have 86 patients in the ICU, 34 patients tonight on ventilators. It is Monday, so let's take a look at our progress and warning indicators, those indicators that we're uh, ensuring are, we're moving in the right direction here in San Antonio during this pandemic. And this week, we've adjusted our risk level titles to better reflect the situation. COVID-19 remains present in our community. So while we are still in the green zone, the actions you take will determine your level of safety from the virus. The green zone uh, is now being called a low risk zone, which matches the labels you've seen in our school indicators. And the low risk zone still means you should wear a mask, keep six feet of distance from others, practice good hygiene habits like washing your hands frequently and staying home if you're sick. We're still continuing to see positive trends in our warning indicators. The 14-day case curve remains in a steady decline, and we continue to have ample testing and contact tracing capacity. We're still seeing also gradual declines in our daily hospitalizations, which is good, but we need to keep working to decrease this number overall. Our doubling rate remains at more than three months, and I'm happy to report that our positivity rate, which had moved in the wrong direction last week, is back moving in the right direction again, and we are now at 5.9%. Remember, the goal is 5% or less, and that would be the indicator which we can begin to open up schools at full occupancy. This week, our hospital stress score improved, so we're closer to reaching the normal range, and so overall, San Antonio is in the green, low-risk zone. If you do go out, remember to mask up and practice physical distancing. Uh, and stay tuned to uh, the city's website for more information. And again, tomorrow, tomorrow night, we'll be going over the school indicator data. Let me turn it over to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Say everybody out there is entitled to a Labor Day certificate for extraordinary conduct beyond the call of duty. Our numbers now, three weeks since Labor Day, are really looking good. The last two days have been in double digits only, 56 and and 63. So I think we've passed that hump. Now we're into the school hump and now we're into the flu season that we need to continue to do all the things that we know we need to do, social distance, face mask, sanitation. If we'll keep that up, we're going to get ourselves through the flu season and have success in our schools also. 
Uh, when the mayor was uh, uh, mentioning all the stress sco scores that we have, you know, our hospital is right close to normal now, a little bit better, and we're going to get down in the low zone. He mentioned the 5.9. That's better than the 6.4 that we had um, last week in terms of positive rates. And we're able to contact way beyond what's happening now. We've got about 152 new cases a day. We can handle up to 1,400. And then our testing capacity is three times what we're experiencing. So we're really staffed up, uh, ready to go if anything goes wrong. Hopefully it's not going to go wrong. Uh, let me mention this. You're going to be getting, uh, those of you that are 65 and older, you may get as many as three or four or five of these. Uh, I got another one today, uh, which is the mail-in ballot. It's a really simple thing to apply for the mail-in ballot, but you only need to do it once. So uh, pick one of those that come across your desk and fill it out and fill it in. Uh, you're doing yourself a service by not having to go to the polls. You're making it easy on our election officials. You're helping with the uh, fight against the COVID. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, vote by mail. If you're 65 and older, you got that right to do it. If you're younger than 65, you still have a right to do it if you can, uh, if you have some medical uh, condition that doesn't allow you to go vote. So just because you're younger than 65 doesn't mean you, 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 you can't do it. So uh, take advantage of the mail ballot. Help save all of us from uh, the COVID issues that we're facing because you don't have to wear a mask when you go to vote. Unfortunately, the mayor, I mean, the governor didn't re require that and tied our hands on that. So take the safe route. Do the mail-in ballot. Great. Thank you, Judge. And again, credit to all of you who have been working so hard to get this uh, infection back under control. Let's continue to work hard. If you have suffered and have, and have uh, been gotten better from COVID-19, remember, we also need you to consider a donation of plasma. You can get more information at SouthTexasBlood.org. And if you all right, that's the update from the city and the county. Judge Nelson Wolf basically saying everybody gets gold star stickers for the extraordinary conduct over Labor Day weekend. He is obviously very happy about the fact the last two days new cases have been under 100 for the first time in a long time in the seven day average now down to 139 per 24 hours. And we are getting closer to that goal of the positivity rate being 5% or under. We are now in the 5% range with 5.9% positivity rate. And as all, they always do on Monday, they talked about the overall risk level for San Antonio right now. They've kind of changed the way they're measuring yeah. that risk. We heard it was safe before. Now the city is calling that risk low. So we are in the low risk level as these numbers continue to head downward. Speaking of gold stars, I would give today a silver star. A silver really? star. I'm, de I'm okay. deducting a little bit for wind. Yeah, I, th I think that's I think that's fair because okay. we did have All wind right. gusts of up to 41 miles per hour around San Antonio, so that definitely knocks us down to silver we'll star. We'll see what the Russian judge says. Yeah. <laughs> hey, how does, how, how does 50s sound in the morning, though, Steve? Uh, that sounds good, too. All right, we'll I have like that, that tomorrow morning. I want to show you the satellite imagery. We're still stuck with some clouds today, uh, but we are starting to see these clear out, and they will clear out throughout the evening hours, and uh, winds will not be as breezy as they are now, which is good news. It's in the 70s. Yesterday, this time, we were in the 90s, and it was humid. We had a heat index value uh, close to 100 in many places, and it was 100 out west. Uh, so this is a very welcome change to our weather pattern. Of course, it does come with those gusts that uh, Steve was mentioning earlier. They have calmed down a little bit, but we're still seeing wind gusts of up to 30 miles per hour from the north. It's good that we're getting a north wind because that's what's filtering in the drier and the cooler air. You can see the big system out here across the Great Lakes. That's that low that's pulling in that uh, more fall-like uh, weather from the north and from the west. There's the front, which is currently working its way across the Gulf of Mexico and the Appalachian Mountains. Temperatures behind this front, not crazy cold. I mean, we're still in the 60s in Colorado, uh, but this is bringing in that drier, more comfortable air. And throughout the evening tonight, with those skies clearing and uh, seeing the winds not as gusty, we're going to be able to cool down into the 40s in the hill country, 46 in Rock Springs and Kerrville, uh, 53 in Del Rio, here around San Antonio, 53 uh, for downtown San Antonio, still in the 40s for Bernie, Timberwood Park, the higher elevations. It's going to be a gorgeous start to 
the day tomorrow with tons of sunshine. That sunshine, though, is going to warm us up. We'll be back into the 80s in the afternoon tomorrow. So again, complete sunshine, low humidity, and winds could gust from the north at 20 miles per hour. So that is very good news for our day tomorrow. You're going to want to dress in layers, a light jacket in the morning hours, not only tomorrow morning, but throughout the rest of this week because the afternoons are going to be warm. But at least we got that low humidity. Looks like a nice forecast to me. Gold star. I'll Thank give that you. a gold star. Thank okay. you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. All right, some good news for a quarterback who's had his share of bad news in the past at UTSA, Gray. When we saw Frank Harris go down in that game against Middle Tennessee just before the end of the first half, we all thought the worst had happened again to that knee when we come back. An update on UTSA star quarterback Frank Harris. The news is much better than we thought. And a Texas high school football legend laid to rest today. Best news possible, knee sprain, a uh, game time decision. UTSA head coach Jeff Triller confirmed the good news today that quarterback Frank Harris only suffered a knee sprain in their win against Middle Tennessee in big board sports. You can almost hear a collective sigh of relief coming from the UTSA campus today as Frank Harris's injury is much better than expected, especially given his history with injuries over the last two seasons. Knocked out of last year in game four after aggravating a shoulder injury, and then the year before that, never got to start after blowing out his knee in practice. This time, the Clemens product has been on fire in the first three games of the season, throwing for 508 yards, three touchdown passes, and another 162 yards on the ground, and five more rushing touchdowns. He's a big reason why the Roadrunners are off to at 3-0 start this season. Harris is brought down hard on his right knee on this play just before the end of the first half against Middle Tennessee on and stayed in the game. But after this pass play, tried to limp back to the bench only to go down on the field. Former Smithson Valley quarterback Josh Atkins, who transferred from New Mexico State, took over from there and threw for 233 yards and a touchdown to hold on to the 37-35 victory, making Trader the first head coach to start his career at UTSA by going 3-0. So since it's a game-time decision, how will the Roadrunners plan around both possibilities of either Harris or Atkins? They both have things they do well, and we'll, we'll, we'll do what those guys can do. And uh, if Frank's 100%, he'll go Saturday. And if he's not, then Josh will go. And congratulations to UTSA freshman linebacker Jamal Ligon, who has been named the Conference USA Defensive Player of the Week after he broke the Roadrunner's single-game record with 19 tackles that included eight solos, one-and-a-half sacks. He now becomes the fourth Roadrunner to be named a Conference USA Player of the Week, which matches the most in school history for an entire single season. Next up, the Roadrunners hit the road to face the University of Alabama at Birmingham on Saturday at 1130. Texas star quarterback Sam Ellinger summed up their overtime victory over Texas Tech and Lubbock on Saturday with these words. I feel like that's the perfect game for 2020. And you know why? Because it was so bizarre. Two block punch, two onside kicks, a two-point conversion to tie the game and send it into overtime where the Longhorns won 63-56. That's right, a combined 118 points where Ellinger threw for five touchdowns. For that, he was named the Big 12 Offensive Player of the Week again. So what did Tom Herman learn about his team on Saturday fighting through the adversity over and over again after being favored by 18 points? For us to, to find the intestinal fortitude to, to come out uh, and, and not give up, not hang their head, down 15 with three, three minutes and some change left, find a way to win that thing. There's a lot of confidence that, that can come from that, but also a lot of humility. Hopefully this humbles some guys in there that thought this, this was going to be easy, that every game was going to be like UTEP. All right, next up for the ninth ranked Longhorns TC at home on Saturday. Their kickoff has been set for 11 a.m. Funeral services were held this morning at Cowboys Fellowship in Jordan for Sonny Detmer, who passed away this past Tuesday at the age of 76. A legendary high school football coach whose last stop was at Somerset High School. Coached both of his sons, Ty and Coy Detmer, in their high school careers. Ty would win the Heisman while at BYU, and later both would have NFL careers that span a combined 24 seasons. His greatest quality uh, in, in every individual he, he came across was his ability to make someone feel better about who they were, and that's who Sonny Detman was. He's an incredible man, and he will be missed. Yes, he will. I had a chance to attend the visitation in Pleasanton last night. The line was out the door. People lining up to pay their respects to the family. Well, you saw the current football players, too, with their jerseys on going into the service today. Exactly. That's all you need to know right there. Exactly. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back.
Police unions across the country are coming under increased scrutiny as calls for reform continue. And to address some of those calls, we want to bring in someone we have had on our show here before for KSAT Q&A, Detective Mike Kelly, president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association. Mike, thank you for being here with us this evening. Since we talked last, those calls for reform, specifically when it comes to collective bargaining, they've continued. And if not, they've even gotten louder. So let's start with your response to where we are today uh, when it comes for local groups petitioning for collective bargaining to be done away with locally. Sure. Well, I, well thank you for having me. But one, I think it's important that the um, where, I think it's also important to note as well as that the, the groups that are calling for um, repealing collective bargaining and for repealing civil service, if you listen to the content that they're talking about, they actually are basing it solely based upon their opinion and nothing is based upon facts. Um, if in fact um, those things were uh, to be repealed and ultimately it is the, the community's decision um, and the voters' decision to make that. Um, I think it would be completely detrimental to the city. Not only would it be to their insurance ratings for the community that uh, that buys insurance here locally, uh, not auto and home insurance, but also we're talking about uh, our AAA bond rating because this is going to affect overall the uh, the funding mechanism to our retiree health care fund and also to our pension fund and, and long term, as well as uh, serving service to the community is going to be affected as well. So I think there's a lot of impactual things that they're not taking into consideration that bargaining can be a mechanism for reform but they're just a flat out refusal on their part to even consider that are you are you heartened at all by the actions that the san antonio city council took in their latest uh budget the fact that that there weren't substantial cuts to the police department like a lot of activists uh you know under let's say the defund the police uh, type mantra we're asking for. Well, sure it was. I think it. I think it went to. Uh, if you listen to, it's a process, right? So if you listen throughout the process and the public hearings that that were being made, uh, there were particularly there were probably two council people that were repeatedly talking about wanting to uh, uh, defer funds from uh, from our police department and put in some other programs that were untested. Um, but at all in all, when it came down to it, I think they listened to the constituency and there was an overwhelming response from the silent majority that were emailing and calling in, telling them that in no certain circumstances that they want our, their police department to be defunded. And that's why the vote went 10-0. I want to go back to something you said just a few seconds ago about how collective bargaining can be a tool for reform. I think that with police departments and unions under such a microscope right now, it's forced a lot of departments to look inward about some things that potentially need to be changed. How would you use collective bargaining as a tool for reform for SAPD? Sure. Well, it's important to know that since, uh, since I've been in office since 2008, SAPOA has been at the pinnacle of that reform. Uh, we, it was our organization in, in the contract in 08 that led to um, uh, mechanisms within our, within our police department that we're currently using today to improve our response times. We came to collection of evidence and for um, response times to the community uh, during the highest peak call hours. Uh, the city didn't bring any of that reform to the table. We did. Um, when the challenge came in the last contract regarding health care, um, the city had a lot of ideas, but none of them. Um, or anything that were very considerable. Um, we brought that reform to the table on healthcare, and today um, we're using that healthcare plan that we developed and we presented. And do, although there was a slew of, uh, I think they spent uh, probably thousands of dollars on um, their own analysts and experts on the healthcare field, when it came down to it, it was our, was our uh, numbers and our analysts that they chose. So. Overall, we probably saved the city with the life of this contract probably north of $75, $78 million. And it was SAPOA that brought that to the forefront. So this is just another challenge. And, um, and I can assure you that uh, we're up to that challenge. And when it comes to um, police accountability, no, no person other, besides myself and, my, and everybody in the police department wants accountability for their police officers. But they wanted to make sure that it's fair accountability. Uh, they want to make sure that it's not anything that's based upon some political decision or or something that uh, um, allows no um, uh, kind of a process, a due process at all for the employee. And as long as we can obtain that and make sure that uh, that the accountability standards are to, um, uh, we can always improve, but as long as they're there 
and, and the community is, is feeling that they're there and believe that they're there and they're acting that they're there, then I think that uh, um, that collective bargaining works. Yeah, and that's, and that's what, what I, we're going to be able to do for you. Yeah, and that's what I want to talk about, uh, Mike, is the fact that, you know, the last time we talked, none of us are sitting here saying that our organizations are perfect. I mean, I know KSAT can improve. I know the city can improve. I certainly, the, uh, you're not here saying the police department can't be improved. Oh, without question. We're, you're, the day you say you're not, you're not, uh, uh, you already know everything and you can't improve is the day you need to leave. Um, every day you learn something new and listening to the community and the needs and we evolve as a police department. And that's why we have civil service and we have collective bargaining. I mean, that staple of civil service has been with us for over 70 years. Uh, and it's been the, the kind of the foundation of our professionalism for our police department. And then bargaining we've had since 74, which has really took us out of the stone ages for attracting other uh, 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 officers from different agencies or people that are graduating from college or living in the military that want to come and and come work here, right? So we need to be able to negotiate benefits and and things of that, of that sort that attract that kind of, uh, of young people that want to be and, and have a career in law enforcement. This is not just a pass through where you're working at. Uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts or you're working at uh, uh, Dairy Queen or HEB for that matter. You want to spend 30, 35 years on this police department and, uh, and it is a wonderful and it's a great place to work, but we can always evolve and make it better. Detective Mike Kelly, president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association. Thanks as always for your time. We'll continue the conversation at 10, sure. uh, Mike, and I want to bring up body cameras uh, because we've got a, a story on that at 10. I want your take on body cameras tonight on the night beat as well. Sure, you bet. Look All forward right. to it. All right, thank you. We'll be right back. If you have acid reflux or take medication for it and have problems remembering simple things, there might be a reason for that. Now, a new study suggests that medicine you may be taking to relieve your acid reflux could cause other side effects. Here's Ursula Perry with the details. Proton pump inhibitors like these over-the-counter drugs help reduce acid production in the stomach. But a new study by researchers at Ohio State University finds the chronic use of PPIs could be causing memory problems. The researchers studied breast cancer patients in three clinical trials. They noted their prescription and over-the-counter medication, then reported any concentration or memory problems. Researchers say the memory problems were between 20 and 29 percent more severe than those reported by patients who didn't use PPIs. The original clinical trials that showed that these were safe drugs to consume were very short term in nature. They were um, like typically less than six months. I think it warrants some caution in, you know, using proton pump inhibitors, especially um, among a population that's already at risk for gastrointestinal issues and potential cognitive decline. Madison says it's not clear whether the memory loss in cancer patients is temporary or it would resolve itself at the end of treatment. It's an area that needs additional study. And there was a hint of this earlier this year in a study of the general population. It showed an association with the chronic use of PPIs along with a higher incidence of dementia in men and women over the age of 75. Chronic use of PPIs is considered a three-month prescription over the course of an 18-month period. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam, 77 degrees out there. Feels like we're finally seeing a change in season. Just finally. in just in time. Yeah, for the removal of stage one water yes. restriction. That Another also welcome tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be able to get out of those stage one water restrictions. Even though the offer is down a little bit, that 10 day average has been in good shape for a while now. Uh, unfortunately, in the pollen count today, mold is high, but it has been windy and I do expect that some of the other allergens are going to pick up a little bit tomorrow uh, because of these winds from the north, specifically tree pollen. So we'll have to wait and see. Winds are gusting up to 30 miles per hour and for the rest of the evening tonight, temperatures will be falling. We'll be in the 50s tomorrow morning. Just how uh, fast did those winds gust today? I'll be back with a look at maximum wind gusts around the area coming up. All right, this morning I was up and outside at 7.30 in the morning, my coffee in hand, 
Watch just it. taking it all in. Well, you know, watching the, uh, the toddler run around. Yeah, that's was, how we Was your hair blowing in the wind, too, and Myra? I, honestly, I was a little chilly. I don't yeah. Know if yeah. I should actually admit that, but I was a little chilly. That's okay. We're, we're from San Antonio, so anytime the temperatures <laughs> dip to like 50 degrees, we bust out the parkas. I'm just <laughs> glad I'm just glad her toddler wasn't blown away. <laughs> yeah, me oh, too. No. That would have been bad, but yeah, he's... Uh, bring it on, wind. He would probably enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did see some very gusty wind out there earlier, especially in the morning hours when the front first moved through, and it's still pretty gusty outside. Uh, you can see that camera shaking. Something to notice, though, is look at those buildings in the foreground. You can see the sun on one side, so we are starting to see these clouds break up already before the sun sets. It's 77 degrees. Winds are steady from the north at 15, but gusting up to 20 six miles per hour around San Antonio. Humidity only at 26%. You instantly notice the winds and the lack of humidity out there. Here's the observed peak wind gust that I promised before the break. Uh, Hondo saw a wind gust of up to 44 miles per hour, 41 miles per hour at the airport in San Antonio, 41 miles per hour around uh, New Braunfels and in Del Rio as well. And then the hill country also clocking in a peak wind gust between about 35 to 40 miles per hour earlier. And again, that front moved through pre on and we've been dealing with cooler weather ever since. Winds are still fairly strong, as I mentioned, from the north at about 15 to 20 miles per hour. Tonight, though, the winds are going to calm down a little bit. It may still be breezy at times, but not as windy as it is outside right now. The calmer winds and the clear conditions are really going to make for a perfect recipe to see temperatures tumble and satellite is starting to clear out there. We're starting to see the clouds clear. And so these temperatures in the 70s uh, should start to to taper down here very shortly and will likely be in the low 60s by um, by midnight, which is pretty nice. Uh, you might want to enjoy a cup of tea on the patio instead of a cup of coffee tonight. Now looking out at the temperature change over the past 24 hours, even though it's not cold, it's definitely a lot cooler. Temperatures about, down about 15 to 20 degrees from how they were this time yesterday when we were in the 90s. And it's a lot less uh, humid. Dew points only in the 40s. Yesterday, dew points were in the 70s. That's when it's really muggy and icky and sticky and gross outside. I don't see anything in the forecast for us to be back in uh, with dew points in the 70s for the next 7 to 10 days. So very nice change there. As I mentioned, temperatures are going to fall into the 60s before midnight tonight. 64 degrees at midnight. Quickly cooling, not as windy, but but occasionally there will be a breeze from the north at about 15 miles per hour. And then this is really, really nice temperatures. If we get down to 53 degrees in San Antonio, that will be the coldest we've been in a long time in San Antonio. Meanwhile, in the hill country in the 40s, anywhere from uh, Kerrville to Bernie to Rock Springs to Bandera, probably going to see a morning low in the upper 40s, even out toward Del Rio, 53 degrees for the morning low. But then watch how we quickly warm up. Temperatures are going to rebound into the 80s tomorrow afternoon. So it's going to be one of those days, in fact, one of those weeks where you'll want to dress in layers, light jacket in the morning, maybe t-shirt in the afternoon. And even though it's going to be in the 80s, we'll have low humidity and complete sunshine, so it'll still feel great. And we could have a wind gust up to 20 miles per hour tomorrow. It's going to stay dry over the next several days. Even though dew points are going to go up slightly, they'll stay in that pleasant range. Uh, by the weekend, we'll be muggy again by Sunday, but again, not as oppressively humid as we were this past weekend. In in the forecast, absolutely no chance for rain. Thankfully, we have a surplus of rain for the month by about a little bit less than half an inch of rain. So we're good in the rain department, so we can just take a deep breath and enjoy this beautiful weather this week. Yeah, getting better in the temperature department, too. Yeah, kind of makes you, you know, besides having warm beverages, maybe, you know, like want to get a pumpkin, you yeah. know, get ready Actually for make it look like fall. Yeah, in case you missed it coming up next. Good morning to you. It is Monday. It is September 28. Teenage girl called 911 around 430 this morning because her parents were fighting. One of the officers shot the man. He was taken to the hospital and is expected to recover. A man accused of stabbing his own mother all while the woman was asleep on the city's south side. According to officers, the suspect and his mother were arguing over car keys. She decided to go to bed. And that's when police say the man stabbed her in the backside. Burger King customers won't be able to place their orders at one east side location anytime soon. After a grease fire broke out on the roof of the building on South WW White at 930 this morning. Initially, firefighters thought the fire was just on the roof. However, 
However, they eventually found out a faulty piece of equipment in the restaurant's kitchen ignited the flames. More than a year after her mother's bones were found inside her Seguin home, Delisa Creighton has been sentenced to 30 years in prison. The bones were found in July of 2019, though investigators believe Creighton's mother fell in a bedroom three years prior. Prosecutors accused Creighton of ignoring her mother's screams for help and forcing a child to live in the home with that decomposing body for years. According to the Seguin Gazette, Creighton pled guilty. Now, Sheriff Javier Salazar says that they got a call for that homicide after one of those neighbors said they found the victim dead inside of the home. Deputies made a tactical entry into the home, discovering that a man in his 40s was dead from multiple stab wounds to his upper body. While inside, they also learned that the suspect, a man in his 20s, was still in the home and still armed with the murder weapon. At that point, deputies exited the home and called for their mental health unit and negotiators who were able to de-escalate the situation. That is all our time. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10.